Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Mark Bennett, the Research Manager at the Royal Armouries, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth talk in our Winter Lecture Series. Today, Armistice Day is a significant one for the museum. Even before the First World War had ended, the Master of the Armouries, Charles Fuchs, had set to work to collect historical material related to the conflict to ensure that its memory was preserved. Uh, for lack of space at the Tower of London, this collection was housed in the former psychiatric hospital at, uh, at Bedlam and subsequently became the Imperial War Museum. Our work of commemorating modern warfare continues, although the current lockdown means unfortunately you won't be able to enjoy our new display covering the Second World War for a little while yet. In the meantime, however, we continue to offer these online lectures as a means of educating and entertaining the public with uh, topics related to arms and armour. These events run until April and they cover topics ranging from medieval archery to 19th century political violence. If you had difficulty joining our previous talk on early gunpowder warfare, apologies. An incorrect setting meant that when the Zoom session was full, new joiners weren't redirected to our YouTube channel where the viewer capacity is functionally unlimited. For future reference, all these events will be streamed through both Zoom and YouTube and will be available to rewatch for a limited time through YouTube. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to us on YouTube to give you easy access both to the live events and the subsequent recordings. As always, there'll be a question and answer session after the talk. If you're watching on YouTube, please type your question in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. If you're watching via Zoom, you'll find a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can type questions. As always, while I can't guarantee to get through them all, I will cover as many as I can. Bear in mind that the nature of today's event does preclude us discussing particular topics and especially case specifics. Now, today's event is also going to run a little bit longer than usual, so if you might have to leave us dead on three, feel free to submit your questions early and watch the Q&A session on YouTube at your convenience. With the necessary administrative preparation out of the way, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Andre Horn. Andre is a team leader in the firearms and, firearms and tool marks division of Eurofins Forensics. The museum has a very close relationship with Eurofins and we're very grateful that he's made time to talk to us today. And today's lecture will be an introduction to the work of the forensic firearms scientist. Without any further ado then, Andre Horn. Right, I can hear you. I hope can hear me all right. Um, good afternoon. My name is Andre Horn, and I'm a senior forensic and firearms and toolmark scientist at Eurofins Forensic Services. Eurofins Forensic Services is the largest forensic service provider in the UK, and we provide forensic services to the police in England and Wales. We are based at the Royal Armouries in Leeds, and they are a tremendous resource to assist us in difficult cases. The large reference firearms collection and friendly courteous staff are always at our disposal whenever we request it. So, what is forensic firearm science? Well, forensics means it's the application of scientific methods and techniques to the investigation of crime. We do the following. We examine weapons and ammunition. Uh, we identify them, we function test them, we classify them. We do bullet and cartridge case comparisons. We examine and interpret firearms evidence at crime scenes and autopsies. We do distance determinations and damage interpretation, accidental discharges, trigger pull examinations. We do specialist related examinations like publications. Um, we examine imitation firearms to see if they are readily convertible 
and whether firearms that had been deactivated are in fact properly done so or de effectively deactivated. We also recover DNA and trace evidence, and we also do two more comparisons and physical fits. There won't be enough time to discuss all our capabilities in detail, but I will touch on the most important and interesting ones. First of all, we need to identify the firearm. They come in different types, calibers, makes, models from different countries and different of different ages. Determining the age is sometimes as important as there are exemptions that apply to antique firearms. We see a big variety of firearms and basically everything that goes is represented in our examinations. Revolvers, pistols, sawn off shotguns, assault rifles, sniper rifles, normal shotguns, submachine guns, machine guns, air weapons, um, imitation firearms, converted imitation firearms, stun guns, and disguised firearms. Um, here we have an imitation firearm that looks just like the real deal. Um, there are offenses uh, defined in the Firearms Act that apply to imitation firearms, so they are also important for us to examine. This imitation firearm has, has actually had its barrel replaced. So this is a converted imitation firearm now capable of discharging projectiles. Stun guns in the UK law are firearms and uh, they are prohibited firearms. Um, if you are found in possession of a stun gun, it could mean a, a five year sentence. We also look at disguised firearms like this uh, firearm here, which has the appearance of a mobile phone. And this is a stun gun with the appearance of a torch. The make and model, uh, country of origin and serial number are usually stamped or engraved on a firearm. But criminals often obliterate these marks to hide the details, and we are required to use hidden manufacturer's marks and proof house marks to assist us with the identification. These are some examples. That's a date code. That, that is a, a country proof house code. That's the caliber. That's the serial number. And these are the details that are normally uh, uh, available on the firearm if they are not obliterated. Once firearms have been tested, we uh, need to determine that they are fully functional. So we would take them to the shooting range and uh, have a bit of fun testing them. After firearms have been properly tested, then we need to classify them. So what is classification? That is, we need to find out which parts of the law apply to a firearm and the circumstances under which it was seized. The Firearms Act has been amended so many times that it's become very complicated to interpret. Here are a number of those acts, only the ones from 1968 to 2007, because I couldn't fit more on the page. So that gives you an idea. We are the only forensic science discipline that have to advise the CPS what offences have been committed due to the complicated act and amendment act. Here is an example of how we classify something. So here we have the definition of a firearm. It's a lethal barreled weapon. So it has to comply with being lethal. It's got to have a barrel. It's got to be a weapon. Included in this definition is also a prohibited weapon. So that is where stun guns will immediately fall under. Then any component parts of such a lethal barreled weapon or prohibited weapon or accessories that diminish the noise or a flash. However, it all appears quite easily, but it's not. 
if you look at the section below, which describes the ban on handguns because of their dimensions, you have this exemption here. The handgun ban applies to weapons other than air weapons. Well, what is an air weapon? That's defined by law, and we have to determine if something is an air weapon. In order to determine if it's an air weapon, we need to classify it. So the classification process involves performing velocity testing. Uh, once we have the velocity, then we can substitute that into a formula with the mass. So we weigh the pellet, we measure the velocity, and we use the formula for kinetic energy, which is half mass times the velocity squared. The units are either joules in the metric system or foot pounds in the imperial system. Now, the answer to that formula will determine if something is a firearm and if it is especially dangerous. If our answer is over a joule, then it's a firearm in terms of the act. If it's over a joule, but less than six or 12 foot pounds, it is still a firearm, but you don't require a license. However, if it's over one joule and you are a section 21 person, then it will be an offense to possess an air weapon. And if an air weapon or air rifle is over 12 foot pounds and a pistol is over six foot pounds, then it becomes especially dangerous air weapon and it actually ceases to be an air weapon in terms of the act. So the exemption that we saw in the previous paragraph then does not apply to an air weapon anymore. It is for this very reason that we are asked to classify firearms because we know the, the, the law and the Firearms Act and Amendments Act absolutely by heart. The lowest recorded energy that actually caused the death of a person was by a pellet with a kinetic energy of 3.7 foot pounds. We have to determine ammunition caliber type, make, and then test fire it to determine if it's functional. Some ammunition types are prohibited by law, and we have to determine if any submitted ammunition complies with the definitions. Now, if you are a Section 21 person, it's an offense to possess any ammunition, including even BBs or pellets. Cartridges consist of four components, the bullet, the propellant, the cartridge case, and the primer. Please do note that the bullet is actually the projectile and not the whole cartridge. The caliber is determined by the diameter of the bullet and the length of the cartridge case. And we find, normally find the information of the manufacturer stamped on the head. So yes, this part of the cartridge is actually called the head. And you can see there that this is a Winchester cartridge and the caliber is 0.38 special. The types of ammunition that are normally prohibited by law include expanding bullets, armor piercing bullets, incendiary bullets, exploding bullets, and bullets containing noxious substances. Now these are identified by paint markings on the tips of the bullets. You can see that all of these bullets have different colors of paint on them. This one, for example, is both an armor piercing and incendiary bullet. The tip codes for different countries vary. Uh, red, for example, is a tracer in uh, NATO countries, but red has a different meaning in the Balkans. Shotgun cartridges contain shots or shot pellets as opposed to bullets. And they are broadly divided into two groups, birdshot and buckshot. And that is determined by the size. Your smaller pellets are birdshot and the bigger pellets are buckshot. 
it's illegal to hunt deer in the UK with buckshot, so it's not that common. Shotgun cartridges also contain wadding, which is a spacer between the shot and the propellant, and they come in plastic or fiber waddings. Most shotgun ammunition can be possessed without a license, unless you are a Section 21 person. Right, next on to firearms identification. And in this context, it means something different. Firearms identification in the context of our work means to link a fired bullet or cartridge case to a firearm or another bullet or cartridge case. And the hypothesis is that any tool coming into contact with a surface softer than itself can leave an impression upon that surface. The mark may be so unique to the tool that made it, and therefore, if the quality is sufficient, we can use it to identify that tool to the exclusion of all others. And in the firearms word, world, that tool would then be the firearm. So marks made on cartridge cases and bullets by firearm components can be called the fingerprint of the firearm. And if we look at them under a microscope, we can tell if they have been fired in that gun or in the same gun. Firearms identification was already in existence during the First World War, and there are a couple of famous cases where the signs, when it was in its infancy, uh, resulted in a couple of miscarriages of justice. However, the one case that put the signs on the map was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago in 1929. Seven members of Bugs Moran's gang uh, were murdered by Al Capone's hitmen in a Chicago garage where they were having uh, a, a card game. And one year later, two recovered Thompson submachine guns were linked to the murders by what, a chap, Calvin Goddard, who we call the father, father of the science. Um, the guns were found stashed at the home of Al Capone's secret accountant during his arrest for a hit and run accident. And because of the success of uh, uh, this examination, shortly after this result, the Chicago Bureau of Forensic uh, of Police Science was established. Um, it was headed by Calvin Goddard, and it was one of the first forensic science laboratories in the uh, United States. So where do the marks on firearms come from? Um, I have a couple of slides with images of uh, section guns. So here we have a firing pin uh, that causes marks on the, the primer of the cartridge case. Um, then we have uh, the barrel, which causes marks on the bullet. And we have things like the extractor um, and the ejector on the other side. Uh, which also cause marks on the cartridge case. The marks are very small, and in order to see them, we need to look at them under a comparison microscope. This is an example of such a comparison microscope, and it gives us the ability to look at things side by side and to compare them. The marks on a bullet uh, are caused by the barrel, and the reason for that is the rifling that we have in a barrel. So rifling in a barrel are a number of spiral grooves that are cut or forged into a barrel. And the purpose of the rifling is to spin the bullet, to stabilize it, which increases its accuracy and range. Now the rifling leaves unique microscopic marks on bullets, and those can be used to identify a specific firearm from which a bullet had been discharged. Here we have an example of rifling with a left hand twist, and the other two are both right hand twist. The center one are uh, micro groove rifle patterns, uh, like we have in some air guns. And this one is also a polygonal uh, pattern which was forged and which was not created by any cutters. Rifling methods, um, there are several, and um, I've got two pictures on here for you. One is a broaching gang. So uh, 
it is a tool with um, a whole bunch of cutters, uh, one behind the other, um, increasing in size, and it's pushed through the barrel. Um, it cuts all the grooves at one go. Um, this is a button. Uh, a, a button is a, a, a not a cutter. It is a tungsten carbide uh, impression of the inside of the barrel, and it's actually forced through a barrel smaller than the button. It then compresses the metal to the uh, correct dimensions. Um, other methods are hook cutters and uh, hammer forging. Here I have some examples of uh, barrels that I photographed. You can see on this one the uh, rifling marks and because of the lighting you can actually see some of the imperfections showing up inside the barrel. Um, there's another one, uh, better quality and highly polished, so not as many marks. Um, here I have some examples of question bullets that have been uh, linked to test bullets. So if we want to know whether a firearm had discharged a bullet recovered from a crime scene, we will fire some test fires and then we will compare the question bullet to the test fired bullet. So over here you can see the rifling impression marks and the markings has the appearance of a barcode and we have to then conduct a search. So we'll set up the uh, question bullet and then on the uh, test bullet, we, we will spin that around and look at it from all the different angles until we find the matching marks. Um, this is another example, uh, another bullet and a, another set of marks. Um, the impressions work. Um, whether it's a lead bullet or a jacketed bullet. Here we have two examples of, of identifications. Again, your question on the left and your test on the right. There are several firearm components that leave marks on a cartridge case, as you can see from this um, sketch. Um, the most important ones for us are breech face marks. This is the breech face of a firing firearm. Uh, firing pin marks, um, extractor marks, ejector marks, um, and chamber marks. Your chamber marks are left by the chamber in the barrel, so they are not part of this system over here. I have two examples here for you. One is of an identification. So you will see that the firing pin mark in there, that has the same appearance. And these were indeed made by the same firing pin. And on this side, I have an elimination. So these two cartridges had not been discharged in the same firearm. Uh, the breech face marks are different and the firing pin impression is also quite different. Over here I have some chamber marks. Um, so these are made on the sides of a cartridge case by the barrel. And you can again see almost barcode like in appearance, matching marks, same width, depth, all the contours match. So we can tell by that, that these two cartridges had been discharged in the same barrel. Over here I have some uh, breech face marks. Again, questioned case on the left, test case on the right, and you can see the almost barcode-like appearance of the marks, and they match. Um, the thin line that you see in the middle here is a artificial line on the comparison microscope. So everything to the left of it is actually one item, and everything to the right of it is another item. Same again on this one, a different type of marks, also breech face marks on a primer. This is a nice example of ejector marks. So you will see that the marks that we look at are very, very small. So you have the two at the top there, then you've got that one there, another two here unique in appearance, and two more marks at the bottom there. Those are called impression marks from uh, an ejector, and this is about a 40 times magnification. 
On this one, we have another kind of ejector. The ejector was made using tools that left some striations on the ejector, and we were able to match these striations to prove that they had been discharged in the same gun. Right, on to crime scene examinations. So we are quite often called to crime scenes to find out what is the firearms related evidence at the scene and can that tell us what had happened? So we will examine the evidence at the scene and try to determine the sequence of events and where locations were, uh, the locations of where individuals uh, were standing or sitting when this happened, where was the shooter, where was the victim. And for that, we need to find all the bullets and cartridge cases at the scene. We need to find bullet holes and impact marks. And then we use that information to determine angles and trajectories. And then we interpret the evidence and come up with a story or a possible hypothesis for the investigating officer to tell them what happened. We will also then attend the autopsies to assist the forensic pathologist and to relate the autopsy findings to the evidence at the scene for further impression. This is an example of a crime scene that I attended and all of these markers are locations where firearm components had been recovered. Uh, a large number of shots had been discharged at this residence and uh, most of the markers that you see here were cartridge cases. However, some of them also indicate where some bullets or bullet fragments had been found. This is the kitchen window and all the bullet holes had been marked up. Um, I marked them up with um, alphabetical numbers. So here we had bullet hole or impact A, B, C and D at the bottom there. And um, Adjacent to this window, you have the wall and the front door, and you'll see the marks continue. There's a mark, there's a mark. Um, those are all have been caused by uh, a pistol, and over here, you had a shotgun discharge. Um, there's actually one bullet stuck in the wall that went between these two sandstone bricks, and it's actually lodged in the mortar between the bricks there. Then, We'll go inside and we'll start looking at the trajectories to determine exactly what the bullet struck, how dangerous it could have been for people inside the house. So here we have one example of a shot coming through the kitchen window of that same premises. It actually struck the underside of the shelf. So this is the, sh the shelf. From the shelf, it was deflected onto the door frame here. The door frame then uh, caused it to ricochet onto the door. By this time, it had lost quite a significant amount of its energy, so it didn't actually perforate the door, but struck the door there. And if you follow the string down, it was recovered from the carpet at the bottom um, of the uh, uh, on the carpet by the, the the entrance to the kitchen. When we um, attend crime scenes, we have techniques to determine uh, the sequence of shots. Um, in glass, for example, this is typically uh, a first shot appearance. And um, the pattern that you see here would be a subsequent strike. So we can determine which was first um, and which shots followed after that. But we can't distinguish between second, third, fourth, and so forth, so on. The um, trace evidence on bullets are very important for us on scenes as well. Um, this is a, a, a good example. Um, you see on this bullet, it's a fired bullet, very deformed, uh, single shotgun slug. Uh, the brown yellow discoloration that you see there um, is actually sand and stone embedded into the bullet. Um, the red is just part of the paint uh, coloration of the bullet. But this was very important in this case because there was conflicting evidence. The shooter had been accused by bystanders of firing directly at a uh, 
a burglar. Um, he, however, uh, claimed that he had discharged a warning shot into the ground. Um, and by analyzing this uh, slug, which was actually recovered from the body of the victim, I was able to determine that it had in fact struck the ground first and it was a ricochet. Um, this is an example of some plasterboard gypsum on a bullet. This bullet is a ricochet. You can see that there's hardly any damage to the nose. All of the damage is to the side of the bullet. And we've got very importantly, some fibers attached to this. And fibers can be quite important to us to um, uh, determine which garments or other upholstered materials a bullet had gone through at, at a crime scene. In this case, we have a, a pristine bullet on the left, and this bullet had actually gone through a glass window. So typical glass damage to this bullet. And if you look at it under uh, even higher uh, magnification, you can see very small fragments of glass embedded into this bullet. And it might be very important to know whether a window had been closed when a shot was discharged or whether it had been smashed afterwards. By examining the damage to the noses of bullets, we can actually determine the angle of the trajectory. So if we look at this one on the side here, this had struck something at an angle of about 30 degrees. Well, perhaps 45 degrees. So the shooter must have been standing at an angle of 45 degrees to the window or object that had been struck by this bullet. So that gives us a line from the impact mark uh, along which we could expect the shooter to have been standing. Quite an important part of our work is also uh, distance determination. When Shot pellets are, for example, discharged from a shotgun. They spread from the muzzle in a cone shape. And the further you are from the muzzle, the bigger the shot pattern becomes. And we would then analyze the shot pattern. We would look at the size and the density. And we would then fire test shots with a similar gun and ammunition to determine how far the shotgun was from the impact. Um, that also holds true for propellant. Um, this is a sample uh, of a photograph that I took 32 years ago before digital photography. And you can see the partially burnt and unburnt propellant particles emerging from the muzzle behind this bullet, again in a cone shape. And by analyzing propellant patterns on skin or garments, we can also determine distance. So here we have some examples for you of uh, propellant residue patterns on skin. Um, and you can see that this shot fired at 50 millimeters, that's about two inches, uh, that's four inches, uh, and that's about 10 inches. So you can see the, the density of the uh, discharge and the size of the pattern in each one of these are remarkably different. And that will then assist us to determine the distance from which a gun was discharged. And this could be particularly important where, for example, there are allegations that a gun had gone off during a struggle. So if we don't find any propellant residue patterns on a victim, we know that um, any uh, so-called evidence or uh, allegations of a struggle could cannot be true. And then finally, um, we're often called to assist the police in determining whether an incident was a murder, an accident, or a suicide, um, because uh, if there are no witnesses, they have to rely on, on the evidence at the scene and what we are able to tell them. So we will look at the mechanical examination of a firearm. Um, we will measure the trigger pull. We will do drop tests to see if it can actually discharge um, without the trigger being pulled. We will look for uh, 
anything at the scene to indicate that it may have been staged to look like a suicide. And there are telltale signs that we are trained to observe, um, which are very important um, where there's an allegation of a, a suicide. Um, so any suicide allegation is, is, is examined very carefully for any evidence of, of staging. Um, I was involved in a case where a, a, a chap had actually uh, murdered his parents and he tried to make it look like uh, his dad had shot his mom and then killed himself. But because of the way that he tried to stage the scene, I was able to tell that it was a double murder and that it was not, um, in fact, a murder-suicide. Um, and then, of course, with suicides, we will look for evidence that is either not compatible with a self-inflicted injury um, or for in evidence that is, in fact, consistent with self-inflicted injuries. And I'm afraid that is all that we are going to have time for today. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I will be answering some questions shortly. Um, hopefully there are some questions which uh, will be led by Mark. And um, yeah, if you don't know the answer, then ask for help. Um, so this is just uh, uh, an example of all the people that we will chuck on a scene to uh, no, I'm just joking. This was a training exercise. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, we will shortly be returning to Mark uh, and the question and answering session. Uh, uh, have a good day and weekend to follow all of you. Goodbye. No, uh, thank you, Andre. I was going to say we've got uh, quite a few questions, a lot of them from me, actually, funnily enough. But if, if you're in the audience and you have something you'd like to ask Andre, you know, please type it in the chat, ask it in the Q&A. Uh, just a, a, a sort of general one to start off with. It's incredible how much you can discover about, you know, uh, the particulars of, a, uh, you know, a, a specific incident. However, one of the things that, that that's often said about forensic science is that you know, the, the prevalence of it in the media makes juries reluctant to convict where the, the evidence isn't necessarily, you know, 100%. Has this view, this, this popular view of forensic science affected the, the work that you do? Mark, well, I, I think there, there is what you can call the CSI syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. People uh, watch series on television and um, which has an element of truth to it, but is not always very accurate. And um, th they expect the same kind of, of um, uh, evidence that they see on those series to be introduced into court. And they expect one person to be able to do everything, which is not quite true. Um, but um, I, I do find that the juries in the country are, are very good. They listen very attentively to what you say, and they um, they consider things very carefully. Um, I, I'm often called to to court to by by CPS, um, not because there's any um, uh, doubt about my evidence, but basically to just assist the jury by explaining firearms terms to them and explaining to them how we got to certain conclusions. Good. Uh, a couple of questions specifically on, on cases, to be honest. Uh, one from Daniel Clark, which is, uh, when you're using cases to identify the gun that's that's been used, how does it work with cases that have been reloaded? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. Cases that have been reloaded um, obviously have been in either the same gun or different gun guns, and the marks um, on on those cases um, um, have to be avoided in areas that came into contact with another gun. Mm -hmm. But for, for cartridge cases that have been reloaded, the most important uh item for us is the primer. So reloaded mm -hmm. cartridges all get a new primer mm -hmm. and the primer is actually a vital source of marks for us because it's quite soft and it contains the firing pin mark and it contains the breech face marks. So um, if, uh, if the marks on the primer match, reloaded cartridges are not a problem for us. Uh, 
I had another question as well. Uh, how easy is it to determine what fired a shot uh, shotgun cartridge if there's no spent case? Hi, Andre. Are you still there by any chance? Yes, um, I lost you there for a moment, so I'm, I'm back. I can hear you now, uh, Mark. I, I don't know uh, technology um, through a ball, so um, let's continue. Perfect. Uh, yes, so the, the, the question, you, uh, I'm not sure if you answered it while I was uh, lagged, but uh, is it easy? how easy is it to determine what fire a shot and cartridge if there's no spent case? Now, I presume that's in relation to maybe stuff like, uh, you know, the, the, the bang sticks, which are just, you know, lengths of pipe. Uh, sorry, can you just repeat that, Mark? Um, I didn't get the question. No problem. So the question is, how easy is it, if at all, to determine what fired a shotgun, shotgun cartridge if there's no spent case? Because I, I, I presume that certain shotguns don't eject, so you're having to, to work on the basis of that. Shotgun cartridges, um, so a, a fired cartridge case can be linked back to a shotgun because um, shotguns also have firing pins and breech face, breech face marks. Mm -hmm. However, shotgun uh, projectiles, the shot, cannot be linked back to a shotgun. Mm -hmm. But uh, the cartridge cases are exactly the same as firearms, um, any other firearm, um, and just as easy to link to a shotgun. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, quick question from uh, YouTube from Connor Prince. How does the smoothing out of rifling over time affect the, the ease of comparison? Um, yes, also, uh, again, a, a very valid question, Mark. <laughs> the, um, over time, the, uh, the rifling inside a gun barrel uh, can deteriorate, mm -hmm. but um, you need to fire thousands of shots for that to happen. And um, I, I've, I've actually been involved in cases where tests were conducted um, and where we were able, after tens of thousands of shots, still to see some um, uh, agreement. However, after about uh, three, four, five thousand, some of the marks did start disappearing. Um, one of the biggest enemies for us is corrosion that takes place in a gun barrel. So uh, if, if it rusts, um, then that can completely destroy all the marks that we look at. Okay. And a question from uh, Leon Peters Malone about homemade firearms. Now, do they have the same type of markings as firearms that are, you know, your, your, standard, uh, your standard ones that you would see? Um, well, all, all firearms have, mm -hmm. uh, uh, th th they are constructed by using tools mm -hmm. and any firearm starts off as a, as a lump of metal and it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's made into shape by tools and those tools leave marks. Um, so firearm components um, have got those tool marks on them. You do find that some of your, your high end and very expensive um types of firearms may have a higher degree of, of polishing so the marks are diminished but we can still link any firearm that has discharged a bullet or cartridge case uh, we can link back to that bullet or cartridge case. Mm -hmm. Yes and I think that also answers uh, Katarina's question there as well which I've just flagged up. Uh, so an interesting question from uh, Jim Hallam obviously the uh, 
the 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 uh the, the the powder residue one brings back you know memories of uh muzzle loading firearms and traditional gunpowder stuff how often do you see muzzle loading firearms used in in crime very very seldom um i think that i have only had in the last say 12 13 years two incidents where muzzle loading firearms were used mm -hmm. So we don't see them in crime much at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Most, I, I presume because the value of them as antiques is more than the value of them in a in a particular uh, crime. Interesting question from from Mark Wilson uh, on the on the technicality side of things. How do you do a drop test for a firearm in a controlled and safe manner? Well, what we do is we. Um, we dismantle a cartridge and we just put a primed cartridge case mm -hmm. in the firearm and then we will subject it to jarring tests and we will drop it on on um, uh, on the floor normally in the shooting range um, uh, from various heights and on various different sides of the firearm to see if it will discharge when dropped and um, if it does d discharge the primer which is completely safe, then we know that it is prone to accidental discharge. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Joshua Senior had quite a detailed question about airsoft guns, uh, production of cartridges, stuff like that. I might suggest, Joshua, we've got uh, our email addresses, inquiries at uh, royalarmories.org. If you drop us a line on that, that's probably the best forum and we can, you know, we have experts in, in legislation, but also we can liaise with, uh, with Andre to, to, to cover that, if that's okay. Uh, Outdoor Technica had an interesting one as well. Uh, how common is the phenomenon of, uh, you know, a, a criminals policing their brass, as it's, it's called, so picking up the used cartridge cases specifically so that you're not able to, to do these kind of tests? Um, it happens, it happens, but not very often. Um, and... Cartridge cases are ejected all over the show. And to be, to be fair, um, in, in, in my experience, all the crime scenes that I've attended, once the shots have been discharged, they don't hang around. They, they, they leg it. So they, they, they've gone. They don't waste the time to um, sp hang around looking for cartridge cases because that's when they, they actually may uh, be caught or... Um, when somebody might uh, pluck up the courage to start shooting back, I suppose. Um, but no, um, it does happen, uh, but but very very seldom. And a, a, a question from Mark Johnson on the uh, the sort of mechanics of this. For comparison marks, do they have to match one hundred percent? Or so what? What's the sort of lowest level that you would accept as you know a, a, an, a, an accurate match almost? Sorry, uh, Mark, I lost audio again. Um, I'm okay. sorry about that. I can't hear a word you're saying. Um, it's, uh, it's okay. It's, it's probably um, the connection on my I end. For that. Um, okay. yeah. Can you hear I, me? I still don't have you back. Um, okay. Uh, what I will do. I can see you talking, but it's all dead quiet. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> Nope, I'm afraid. Um, I okay. can you just wave at me if you can hear me? All right, okay, that's good. But um, I I can't hear a word, so I, I I'm afraid I can't hear the uh, the questions. I don't know where the audio has gone. I've just tried muting and unmuting. Is that any use? All right, I can see the question coming up on my screen on the on the chat line here. So, what percentage of accuracy would you accept for a match? Um, that's quite an interesting question as well, um, where, where fingerprint experts um, normally have a specific number of marks that they look at that need to match. Um, for us, it is not the same. So we will look at the quality of the mark. And if, if it's a good quality mark, um, we, can, uh, we can make a match on, 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 um, on much fewer uh, um, different marks. Um, that make up a, uh, a complex of marks. Um, 
we 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 don't apply the principle of trying to uh, um, attribute a percentage to a mark. For us, it's either yes or no or I don't know. So, mm -hmm. the moment we're in doubt, we will say it's an inconclusive result. Um, the only time that we will ever call a match is if we are 100% sure. So we only work on 100% percentage. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, I don't suppose you can hear me now, can you? Right, I still haven't got audio, so... Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if you you can pop on the next question um, on the chat line and I'll see if I can answer that. Uh, yeah, perfect, thank you. <laughs> Oh dear, I um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I, I used to know, but that's in, <laughs> that's um, that's quite a long time uh, ago. Mm -hmm. So we are going back to the um, uh, early um, 1900s. Um, exactly who it was, um, I'm not sure, but there are f uh, there are a few famous cases in in America. Um, dating back to, I suppose, uh, the First World War, just prior to the First World War. So that's when it first started um, being used in, 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 um, in solving crime by the police. And um, unfortunately, there were also some charlatans about, and there are a few very infamous cases where there was miscarriage of justice, where not enough was known about these markings and where people were um, convicted for something that they um, hadn't done. Great. Uh, I will just drop another question in the chat. There you go. So this is what I'm interested in as well. Right, I see the next one. Um, how, how did I get into this? <laughs> well, um, I studied medical science, and um, when I was a student, um, I well, I, I've always, as a kid, been interested in, in, in shooting. I had a, a, an air rifle when I was a kid, and when I started my, my studies, um, um, uh, I just decided to, 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 to start um, uh, getting into to, to proper guns and uh, I, I purchased a handgun um, and I went to the local shooting range where I um, uh, practiced. And I was one day approached by a chap there who um, said, it looks like you've got some talent and we need um, additional staff for the shooting range. Would you like to become a, a, a firearms instructor? Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't pass up the, uh, the opportunity and um, I, uh, enrolled into the, uh, the, the the training as a firearms instructor which which took about a year and um, so I was still a student studying at, at uni for for medical science and in my second year um, I earned my pocket money by uh, teaching people how to shoot and um, then having completed my studies in medical science um, I uh, decided to approach the Police Forensic Science Laboratory to, to become a biologist. And again, bumped into a chap um, who uh, knew me from the shooting range and said, well, do you know that the ballistics section have a vacancy? Uh, I said, no, what is the ballistics section? And um, I was uh, promptly marched into the office of the ballistics commander. Um, and 10 minutes later, I had a job. Um, so I actually never went to the interview as a biologist, which I'm eternally grateful uh, for today because I, I enjoy firearms. Uh, I, I, I still don't have audio, but um, no, maybe you could uh, pop the question onto the chat. In terms of um, shooting recreationally, um, I, I, I used to um, do practical uh, pistol shooting as a sport, uh, and, and I was also uh, I did deer stalking. Um, currently, I am not um, doing anything recreationally. I just uh, work, but um, I, I do plan to get back into deer stalking. Good. So uh, just for the benefit of the audience, uh, question from a number of people, where do firearms currently used in crime tend to come from? So, 
Uh, I think that covers you. Right. Um, I still don't know if audio mark, but the question popped up on my screen here. So, um, where do firearms currently used in crime come from? Right. Um, handguns are banned in the United Kingdom, so you can't buy them here. They have to be obtained from um, by illegal means, and so they are either imported, smuggled into the country uh, via uh, various channels, either from Europe or the United States. Um, that's quite difficult to do, um, especially uh, with the strict security at the airport. So it's it's it, it's mostly smuggled in with containers of other stuff or um, in cars that do the channel crossings. Um, and then, of course, people um, often try to make homemade firearms, but we don't see many of those. What we see more are um, conversion of imitation firearms. So people will take an imitation firearm incapable of discharging projectiles and they will uh, drill out the blockages in the barrel or um, replace the barrel entirely. Um, and those would be used in crime. Um, I would... Um, say that some firearms are also stolen from from legal firearm owners mostly shotguns um, but rifles we don't see often um, it is probably mostly shotguns which are which are then subsequently sawn off for the for the portability and uh, people use them in crime um, so i think that more or less answers that question um, I was going to say, uh, uh, for the benefit of the audience, given the difficulties of the communication. Right, I, I can see your message on here. So um, one last question. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question well, is what's been a big development? That's a good question. <laughs> and I, I, I don't quite know the answer. <laughs> Firearms have been the same um, for, for, for many, many years. I mean, we are, we are looking at um, the development of pistols, um, like the very famous Luger pistol in 1908, the very famous Colt 45 in 1911, and nothing has really changed since then. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, firearms accessories have, have, have changed over time, and firearms have become... Um, uh, not all metal based, but as, as, um, uh, they've started using plastic components for the frame. But essentially, it is still the same gun, still working on the same principles um, with a metal barrel. Um, I know people are often concerned and wonder about 3D, uh, 3D printed guns, but that is not something that's going to happen very quickly because generally your your printing material is of such an inferior quality that it can't handle the pressures of, of um, uh, firearms. So there isn't really uh, any real threat from 3D printed guns. Um, I don't foresee that, that guns will change whatsoever over the next five or 10 years, other than maybe becoming more futuristic looking or um, mm -hmm. maybe have shiny and uh, nice um, attachments and finishes, um, but I don't think anything will, else will change much. Hmm. I was going to say, I've just... Right, one, uh, I see one more question. Will, will big data, i.e. image recognition, ever replace forensics? Um, In identifying tool marks. Well, there, there is already a, a, a computerized system because um, as with uh, fingerprints, we have um, in the United Kingdom a, a national database. All bullets and cartridge cases that are recovered from crime scenes are um, held at a, a, a central facility. Well, actually, there, there are a couple of branches, um, uh, one in, in Manchester, one in uh, Birmingham and, and one in London. And um, whenever a firearm is then um, recovered, uh, we send off test fires to these facilities um, and they will then compare the test fires to this 
big national database of bullets and cartridge cases um, to find out if that gun had been used in a crime somewhere um, prior to it, it, it being recovered. And for this, um, they are using computer science. Um, the, the, the images of the bullets and cartridge cases are scanned into a, a system and it's actually the algorithms that are compared, not the, the, the images. Um, there, there have been some good developments, um, but it's can't, it still cannot replace a person. So all it does at the moment is it, it, it does a... Um, uh, it gives you a hit list. So say um, for this particular gun that you are trying to match, we've got 20 possible uh, hits. Uh, that's what it's called. And um, all of those hits then still have to be checked physically by a person. Um, they haven't been able to develop a system that could replace the forensic scientist uh, entirely. And then, of course, um, Whenever we need to um, uh, give evidence in court, you can't send an AI or a computer to court. It still has to be a person. So uh, uh, I, I think they will still have use for us in, 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 uh, until such time that they have to completely do away with courts. And all courts are done by AI as well. <laughs> so. oh, that's great. Because, I mean, I would hate to think of... Uh, you know, data, AI, computers replacing such a wealth of knowledge and experience, but, uh, you know, equally, as long as it's making your job easier, that's, that's fantastic. So thank you very much, Andre. Uh, apologies to, for the, for the technical difficulties, but we have managed hopefully to, to bring a reasonably complete experience uh, to everyone. And unfortunately that is all the time we have for today, but, you know, I'd like to reiterate my thanks to Andre for giving today's presentation and to Adam for, producing the event behind the scenes. And thank you to the audience for taking time out of your day to attend and for all the questions you had for our speaker, unfortunately. I didn't manage to get through them all, but hopefully we've had an interesting uh, post-event discussion nevertheless. Our next event on the 25th of November continues to explore the more modern elements of our collection. Cyril Dixon will give us an insight into the work of the Special Operations Executive, the force tasked by Churchill with setting Europe ablaze. For more details, please go to our website, which is royalarmies.org. I look forward to seeing you there in two weeks' time. Thank you and good afternoon.